Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Hope you had a, a good opportunity to visit the extraordinary exhibitors on the exhibit floor and uh, ex extend your and continue your professional development. Before we begin the, the next panel, a couple of introductions. We're very honored this afternoon to be joined by the Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Sergeant Major of the Army, welcome. We're pleased to have you here. No pressure, panel, no pressure at all. That's right. And Sergeant Major of the Army retired, Ray Chandler has joined us as well. Sergeant Major of Army Chandler, thank you. You know, one of the things I, I learned as I was growing up in the Army, and particularly as I got a little bit more senior, and you learn that, that uh, while national security policy might be crafted and developed and, and written in Washington, D.C., national security policy is, been, is, is implemented by soldiers and sergeants and staff sergeants on, on the front lines. Uh, and I think that's relevant to, to this topic. We've talked a lot over the past couple of days about, about changing culture, about changing the, the, changing the dynamic, as General Perner reminded us this morning, of, of taking on the status quo and changing it, changing Army culture. And I would say, while that intent may come out of Washington, D.C., changing the Army culture is done by those who wear stripes uh, more so than those who wear bars, oak leaves, and, and stars. So we're very honored uh, this afternoon to have a, a great non-commissioned officer panel uh, addressing the topic of training, educating, and progressive development of our soldiers for today and tomorrow, consistent with the theme for this Global Force Symposium and Exhibition. Moderating this panel is no stranger to those in this room Sergeant Major of the Army, retired Ken Preston, uh, Vice President, Non-Commissioned Officer and Soldier Programs at the Association. Sergeant Major of the Army, Preston, off to you, sir. Thank you. Warm welcome for you. Well, sir, thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much for everybody out there attending and, uh, of course, our panel members up here. Um, and I know as the, uh, the professional development panels that we had here earlier today, uh, I want to recognize AUSA, and really it's, uh, it's the folks that you see running around in here, you know, Michael Scanlon and, and uh, General McQuiston, who did a lot of work and effort behind the scenes here to make sure that uh, the meetings part of this was set up and ready to go, and I'd like to recognize them with a big round of applause. That was for you, Mike. So training, educating, and uh, progressive development for soldiers and non-commissioned officers, and uh, for this panel, the way we're going to operate um, you know, here today is I'm going to do a few opening remarks and, and really what I want to do is set the stage for you know, where we are right now today with uh, the professional development of soldiers and non-commissioned officers. And for those that have uh, been part of the non-commissioned officer education system, I think that uh, this presentation today will be a real treat and it'll allow you to kind of see and appreciate you know, where this panel, many of these subject matter experts who have been part of that process, uh, where the SMA has taken uh, the Army, uh, and where we're going for the future. Um, Mr. Michael Scanlon, along with uh, Command Sergeant Major Retired Troy Welch, Command Sergeant Major Retired Jimmy Spencer, they're going to help out with uh, the question cards. And, uh, and each of our panel members will be given 10 minutes for each of their presentations. And I'd ask you to, to, to generate your questions. And uh, the really tough, tough questions, as hard as you can get, because uh, this panel of experts up here are, are ready for it. So just uh, a couple introductions here, just to show you, uh, who we've got up here. Uh, on the panel, we've got, uh, and I'll start with Command Sergeant Major Dan Elder. Um, and Command Sergeant Major retired Dan Elder was, uh, he was the 13th COSCOM uh, Command Sergeant Major uh, down at Fort Hood, Texas. He served as the Army Materiel Command uh, Command Sergeant Major, so for Command Sergeant Major Mansker, uh, he's one of uh, you know, the predecessors for the Sergeant Major. Uh, but uh, Dan has gone on to do a lot of other things. He's also a senior fellow uh, at your association, the Association of the United States Army. Uh, he's also been um, uh, the editor for uh, the most recent update of the Sergeant Major of the Army quote book. Uh, he's co-authored a number of books out there. Uh, his latest uh, book that he co-authored uh, was the book titled uh, Soldier for Life, uh, which is the story of uh, Sergeant Major of the Army Jack Tilly. And if you get the opportunity to read that book, and, and since the SMA Tilly's not here, I will tell you, you'll see just how much talent 
Dan Elder really has to be able to make that book look good. <laughs> um, also here on the panel today, we got uh, Command Star Major uh, Dave Turnbull. And uh, Dave is the Command Star Major at the Combined Arms Center at, uh, at Fort Leavenworth. And uh, previously, uh, Command Star Major Turnbull served as the uh, Command Star Major for U.S. Army Alaska. Uh, he also served um, as the Command Star Major for the Military District of Washington. And I will tell you that that's no small feat being there in uh, the military district and all the things that go on there in D.C. But uh, Command Star Major Turnbull is also today filling in. He's wearing a number of different hats. So not only is he the, the CAC Star Major, but he's also covering down for Command Star Major Davenport, uh, the TRADOC Command Star Major. And he's covering down also for Command Star Major Sellers uh, from the Star Majors Academy. So a lot of those types of questions, uh, Command Star Major uh, Turnbull will be able to talk and, uh, and address. And, and like I said in my opening remarks, uh, if you're familiar with non-commissioned officer education, you're going to be uh, really surprised at where the Army has gone and where it's going uh, for professional development. Uh, Command Sergeant Major retired uh, John Sparks, uh, my battle buddy, uh, and I would tell you that uh, you know Command Sergeant Major Sparks uh, served as the uh, as the Tradoc Command Sergeant Major. He was a Command Sergeant Major for CAC, also at uh, Fort Leavenworth. He was a Command Sergeant Major for Third Army and the Division Command Sergeant Major for the fabled First Team. Um, Sergeant Major Sparks is. Um, you know, he, he works, and, and you'll see, learn a lot from him on the, uh, the nominative um, and executive SAR Major uh, program. Uh, he serves as a special advisor to the SAR Major of the Army, and, you know, the uh, SMA Daily has him going to many, many places around the country uh, to really look at uh, where we are right now with, with our education system and what we can do to make it better. And you're going to learn a lot from him about talent management. And then down on the end down there is... Uh, First Sergeant uh, Stephen Canonico. And, uh, and Steve now, he's our, our newest addition to the, uh, the Association United States Army team. Uh, we, we hired him out of uh, the Soldier for Life office, which was his last position. But I would tell you that uh, Steve has also served as a, as a First Sergeant in uh, a number of different occasions. And one of the things I used to tell people is that every soldier in the Army has a First Sergeant. The Sergeant Major of the Army has a first sergeant. The Chief of Staff of the Army, General Milley, has a first sergeant. And, uh, and First Sergeant Canonico, is, uh, he's been one of those first sergeants. Uh, he was the first sergeant for Headquarters and Headquarters Company, U.S. Forces Korea. So you can imagine being the first sergeant of a headquarters company for a four-star command. So he's done those, those tough assignments and those tough jobs. But as part of Soldier for Life, I would tell you that uh, you know, he has been part of um, the Hiring Our Heroes program, the development of that process to be able to take soldiers out there that are in that last year of assignment prior to leaving the service and to be able to get hired on um, through an internship with industry before you ever leave. You know, to be paid by the Army to go to work for some other company out there and then to be able to directly transition from the Army into corporate America. And so he could talk about a lot of those things, and I look forward to your questions that you might have uh, in those regard. So yesterday we heard, from, uh, we heard from the Secretary of the Army, we heard from the, the Undersecretary, and we heard from the Vice Chief. And they laid out and they talked about modernization priorities. They talked about long-range precision fires. You know, they talked about uh, today, on today's panel, we talked about, uh, you know, vertical lift. We talked about the next generation of combat vehicles. We talked about, uh, we're going to talk about the Army network, uh, air and missile defense, and of course, increased soldier lethality. But in every one of those modernization initiatives, there's, there's soldiers that are involved. There's soldiers and there's non-commissioned officers. And, and when you look at the Army right now around the world, uh, it's about 180,000 soldiers currently deployed or forward stationed to more than 140 countries. And when you look at the structure of the Army across all three components, the regular Army, the Army National Guard, and the Army Reserve, uh, it's about one million strong. And within that one million, you know, right now the Army's structured where about 84 percent is uh, enlisted volunteers. And that's the soldiers and the non-commissioned officers. 
The other 16%, of course, are our commissioned officers and warrant officers. But for this panel, and to put things in perspective, you know, that 84% out there, when you look at the, the demographics, it's about 1% out there that serve at the SAR Major and Command SAR Major levels. Uh, it's about 2.5% uh, that serve like the first sergeant down there as a first sergeant or a master sergeant. It's about 10.2% uh, at the SARP first class or platoon sergeant level, 16.8% at the staff sergeant level, and 20% at the sergeant level. So when you look at that 84% of the enlisted force, 50% are non-commissioned officers. And I, I share that with you just as a, as a data point for their presentations here this afternoon. So one of the things that uh, the, the undersecretary said yesterday, he said that organizations that do not change risk failure. So today we ask ourselves, what can we do to enhance, improve our training, our education, and the progressive development of our soldiers and our non-commissioned officers? You know, the, uh, the under and the secretary, uh, the secretary of the Army yesterday, they talked about uh, the emergent Russia. They talked about China and where China is now currently um, invested around the world. They talked about uh, North Korea and that particular threat and the threat of, a, um, of ISIS and uh, you know, that threat that's now across many countries out there. So when you look at the 180,000 soldiers right now currently deployed or forward stationed in 140 countries, many of those units out there are currently led by small team leaders, squad leaders, uh, crew commanders, and platoon sergeants and platoon leaders. So with that, and I'm very honored now to kind of turn this over to the panel, and I'm going to start with, uh, with Command Sergeant Major Dan Elder. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I appreciate being out here. Uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to be a part of this panel. We're, we're, we're speaking a lot uh, this week about future. Uh, the recent uh, release of uh, the Army Futures Command uh, caused, caused quite a buzz. What I want to do is I want to look backwards, though. Uh, I'm, I'm going to kick off and talk a little bit about training, education of our Army non-commissioned officers. We, we, we know where we're at today uh, as the Army leaders create and craft the vision for the future. Uh, it's always good to know where we've come from to help us shape ideas and discussions and dialogue. So I think here at this, uh, at this uh, conference and conferences like this, having a sense of the history that's gone on before us, particularly when it comes to educating the professional enlisted force, non-commissioned officers, it's, it, it may be surprising to many of you to, to know that we did not have a formal education system for about the first 200 years of our Army's history. I also felt like uh, that uh, Dr. Esper, our great Secretary of the Army, laid the foundation yesterday when as he talked about, uh, as he spoke uh, at the beginning of his speech about a critical time in our Army's growth and development that he zeroed in on the year 1973, which also happens to be the time frame, uh, a period of time where the Army NCO education system actually grew and, and was birthed. So I want to take it back a few years before then, uh, 1775. Uh, if you look back to Washington's army once it was formed, uh, the, the, the army, the Revolutionary Army, basically adopted tactics and techniques that, that came from overseas, but that uh, the militia, uh, the, the, the Minutemen, the, the great Americans who were forming our, our nation, relied on tactics that had already existed. And as, they, as Washington formed his army, we all know the story of Valley Forge and the hardship that soldiers endured. But during that time in, in that era, training, and when you speak of NCO education, you always have to, uh, the, the conflict between training and education, there, there is quite often a, a connection. There's a symbiotic relationship between the two. And so as Washington was trying to keep the ragtag army together, uh, an advisor 
uh, who happened to be on the scene and was attempting to sell his services to Washington uh, was, a, was a man by the name of uh, Baron von Steuben. And many non-commissioned officers know of him as the father of the Blue Book. Training education of enlisted soldiers happened in the unit. It happened by unit leaders, and it was done on the job, something that we call OJT. So some might argue the first time we took the responsibility to train and educate leaders may have been by von Steuben when 120 men from Washington's, or from the state uh, units were brought together uh, at, at one location where Steuben, von Steuben trained, he drilled them. Uh, he's quite often referred to as the first army drill master. And he trained and taught uh, non-commissioned officers how to train soldiers, which then began to create uh, a, a model that the remainder of Washington's army went on to copy and which allowed them to uh, create many of the successes that our Revolutionary Army experienced. So after the war, as we demobilize, there was not much thought to the, the idea of of separate instructions or training for non-commissioned officers. The Army stayed in a, uh, though as small as it was initially, and see an incremental growth, training and education remained a responsibility of Army leaders in the unit. Uh, during the, revel during the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the conflict between uh, the, 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 the North and the South, uh, during our Civil War, uh, though there was talk from leaders like uh, General uh, Silas Casey in his series of tactic manuals calling for specialized NCO training. It often fell on deaf ears. Uh, training remained in the unit by unit leaders, and there were no special programs to educate non-commissioned officers. During World War I, General Blackjack Pershing complained about the lack of training our Army Doughboy NCOs had. Uh, he was quoted as saying, more stress should be laid upon the responsibility and training of sergeants so that they could step in and replace officers once casualties. We went into, uh, during massive mobilizations that we experienced in World War I, that was repeated again in World War II, as we had to surge and grow units, uh, non-commissioned officers were quickly and rapidly trained usually in battlefield tactics and techniques and the thoughts of education, educating, leader development, professional development was either not considered an afterthought or catch as can. It wasn't until the end of World War II as the Army uh, formed uh, a, a, a stronger peacetime army, army particularly uh, for occupation duty first in the Mediterranean and then in the European theaters of operation, uh, the Army formed uh, a unique and special unit. And because of a need for new types of requirements, I don't have the slide clicker, so how do we? Just ne next slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, during occupation duties, uh, much like we find ourselves today, as an army where we have requirements for different skill sets for our soldiers and our non-commissioned officers, army leaders in the European theater also found that themselves in that type of predicament. And one of the solutions that was created was the establishment of a constabulary school. A constabulary was a lightly armored mobile force that uh, kept the peace and, and uh, in some cases uh, provided uh, uh, law enforcement type services and they realized the need for these different types of skills. Because of that, uh, an NCO school was added to the curriculum and that stayed in place for a few years uh, until the Army stood down the constabulary. One, one of the constabulary leaders was General Bruce C. Clark uh, Clark of St. Vith, or the Sergeant's General, was a strong advocate for creating NCO academies and was a Johnny Appleseed of creating these unit or regimental or division uh, or area type NCO academies. However, they had little standardization. 
There was never any requirement to attend. It was catch as can. Uh, the first Sergeant Major of the Army, William O. Woolridge, when asking his first sergeant if he could attend the NCO Academy, was told, you're a combat veteran, you know all that you need to know. So as time began to, uh, to pass, NCO Academies were not budgeted for and were falling in disrepair uh, during the mobilization for Korea. Again, we relied on surge in training prior to, to uh, or post-mobilization with very little training skills. We brought that type of model to Vietnam, and uh, however, Vietnam was a much different type of battle, battles which were conducted at the squad and platoon level. And because of the drain of career non-commissioned officers, the Army created the non-commissioned officer candidate program which then, which took uh, highly uh, aptitude, uh, basic training attendees, either draftees or not, and put them through a officer candidate-like school that after a period of training in OJT, they were promoted to staff sar or to sergeant or staff sergeant and led squads in Vietnam. At the, at the, uh, at the realization of the end of hostilities in the Army, uh, coming to a conclusion of, of the uh, involvement in Vietnam, they recognized the opportunity to maximize the investment made in the NCO candidate course and use that structure to carve out what is now, what was then known as the non-commissioned officer education system, now known as the non-commissioned officer professional development system. Mostly unchanged, it wasn't until 1986 that we tied promotion to education, and for the first time, we had a serious NCO Academy, uh, NCO education process that had some teeth. However, it was separate and distinct. It was part of enlisted personnel management system, but it was its own standalone system. Through recent changes since the NCO 2020 directives uh, and the creation of STEP, select, train, educate, and promote, we have now created a, a, a more modern education system that incorporates uh, many of the requirements uh, based on, on Army needs. So this is where we've come from today. We, we, we find ourselves at the apex of NCO 2020 and the non-commissioned officer professional development system. Where do we need to take it next? Team, it's up to you all. Thank you. All right, Sergeant Major Turnbull. All right, good morning or good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, great lead in for this. In 2016, the, go to the next slide. Slide, please. 2016, one more. The uh, Chief of Staff of the Army signed the implementation of the NCO Non Commissioned Officer Professional Development System, which would replace NCO ES. Um, and since that time, TRADOC CAC, the Sergeant Major Academy and all our centers of excellence have been working extremely hard uh, to change our uh, education system for the future. And a lot of these changes came from the, the force. Our NCOs and the NCO 2020 uh, survey that came out in 2013, the, I, the uh, IG CASL, CASL report, and then two NCO solariums uh, held at Fort Leavenworth. Our NCOs Sergeant First Classes, Master Sergeants were the ones that uh, really pushed for a change in our curriculum and our POI across all levels of our education. And what they said, uh, resounding across all these surveys and reports, was our education wasn't relevant, it wasn't rigorous, it wasn't synchronized, uh, it wasn't preparing them for fully for what they needed to do in the future. Um, and a lot of redundancy that was going on. So we've made some major changes, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the changes uh, to show you where we're going, going next. Uh, slide, please. So uh, Dan talked about 1973, the stand-up of TRADOC. Uh, our first uh, NCO education system started for, for NCOs. Um, and then we look at today, that, or the, the NCO of 1973 just coming out of Vietnam, um, education was established for a known enemy on the Lydia battlefield. 
Um, but today we're progressing, we're changing that for an unknown enemy, an asymmetrical air, uh, or multi-domain battlefield for an unknown enemy, which will give the NCOs the tools they need for future fights. Now, a few of the things we're doing um, across all spectrums of education, from BLC to the SAR Major Academy. There's no more multiple choice questions. Writing will be important. It'll be critical to the NCO to be able to write um, complete thoughts. And no more multiple, qu multiple choice questions. Um, the content will have more practical application. Uh, assessments are gonna be based on abilities and outcomes versus uh, yes or no questions. Um, and we're gonna focus on leader competencies and their attributes. Slide, please. One more, there we go. Okay, so this is the curriculum uh, continuum across all aspects of our education. Um, if you look up at the right hand, uh, left hand corner, you'll see the 19 uh, leader core competencies in the t for ALC and the 23 leader core competencies for SLC. So those are, those are modules taken from the uh, leader core competencies at the bottom in the blue. Those six, communication, leadership, program management, operations, training management, and readiness, are continuous from BLC all the way to the Sergeant Major Academy. Those six core competencies. Those six leader core competencies replace what we normally refer to as Common Core, which as we looked at uh, Common Core across our CMFs, there were there was no standardization. There was no such thing as Common Core. It was simply just a name we called it, what we thought was common. So these six across the bottom there will stay continuous from BLC to the Sergeant Major Academy. Of course, as the soldier progresses through their education, uh, more deep dive into those subject areas, um, understanding knowledge of what we um, have laid out. So the other thing we've uh, major change is SLC, um, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, SSD will be changed this June 1st. The first uh, SSD will come out for BLC. Um, each one of them will be roughly 40 hours in length, and they'll precede the same material that they'll talk about at the next brick and mortar school. It will not be a pass and fail uh, course, it would be grade point average, where that GPA will go on to their 1059 or the AAR for the next brick and mortar school. Um, they're not going to be, again, they're not going to be yes or no questions, but they're going to be interactive um, and situational based. Um, the goal is for a soldier to be auto enrolled to that course as they become promotable. As we work the new promotion system, we have a little bit work to do with HRC, but we want the soldier to take that dis distributive learning course just shortly prior to them going to the brick and mortar in order for that material to be fresh in their heads um, as they go to the next course. Uh, let's see, what am I talking about? Okay, so the, uh, the other two additions, uh, I think Mr. Sparks is gonna talk about, Sergeant Major Sparks Retirement is gonna talk about that is the uh, not really the course, but the other course we added was the um, Master Leader course for our Sergeant First Class Promotables. That's the gap we filled between SLC and the Sergeant Major Academy. Um, very, very good progress working on that course, uh, getting our, our senior leaders uh, prepared to go to the Sergeant Major Academy, take on roles and responsibilities as a first sergeant. It is not a replacement for the first sergeant academy or the first sergeant course that we we, uh, we once had, but it's to set them up for positions of leadership at that senior level. Slide, please. I'm gonna talk a little bit about credentialing um, that uh, we've also been working very hard at. We, uh, we briefed this to the Sergeant Major of the Army uh, two weeks ago, and this is the current uh, path that we're working on um, as we speak today. Um, and what I talk about credentials, any tangible evidence, knowledge, skills, or ability uh, an individual possesses. 
And there's a whole host of credentials across the spectrum um, that's available to our soldiers. What we want to do is we want to maintain or maximize the opportunity for soldiers within their training, education, and experience the system and to, to be credentialed in something that they desire or is a life goal for them. These are not simply credentials for a soldier to receive shortly before they get out of the Army. It's just to improve a soldier's professionalism in the Army, their abilities and skills while they perform their, their current job. So we have, uh, we have a couple different bins we've, we've placed um, our credentials into. Uh, military on, this, on the far left, where we currently have about seven credentials, mostly in the AMED field, that our soldiers have to be credentialed in to perform their job. We believe this will be increased as uh, we do more cyber work and more signal expertise. We'll have certain credentials that our soldiers will need to have um, in order to do their MOS. Uh, the middle bin, our MOS, MOS enhancing credentials uh, that will help um, our soldiers again do their, do their primary function. And those will be led by proponents in our centers and schools that will maintain which credentials they want our soldiers to have. And then on the far right is those credentials that a soldier um, would like to possess or to attain prior to getting out of the Army. Again, not necessarily uh, something to do right before they get out, but at, at any time in the Army. Um, mostly self-development, not related to their field or their MOS. And we have over 11,000 credentials that are available to our soldiers currently. What we're working on now to reduce those to a manageable size that our proponents can either bring into the, into the uh, credentialing program or uh, leave out, uh, guiding our soldiers to do the credential that uh, will best gear them to do uh, their MOS. That's all. I'll leave it at there, Sergeant Major. Okay. All right. With that, uh, John. Next yes, slide, please. One more. One more. Uh, next slide. All right. My name is John Sparks, and I'm going to talk to you about nominative Sergeant Major education and assignments. Before I start with with the slides, I want to tell you why you want to know about it. When I was walking around the group, uh, or walking around the the uh, seats a little while ago, there I saw that there's several mid and senior non-commissioned officers, and a lot of junior enlisted folks. So you would think, why would we be telling you about nominative sergeant majors and how they're trained and educated? Well, first off, a nominative sergeant major is a sergeant major that works for a general officer in command. Example might be Sergeant Major Mansker in AMC, or a division sergeant major, or the trade or force comp sergeant major. Roughly, that, that population of sergeants major in the Army hovers around 200, plus or minus. The reason why you want to know how we train them and educate them is really twofold. The first reason would be so you know what you might look forward to someday, something for you to strive for, something for you to want to be. The second reason is to have confidence in your leadership, to understand that when we promote or assign a sergeant major into the nominative assignment world, when he, when he gets the, the, the ability, the, when he's hired, when he when he is allowed to work for a general officer and supervise so many, so many soldiers in a major command or a large command, you need to understand the process that we go through and how we train and educate them so you can have a little more confidence in that person that's in the front that leads you every day. So next slide, please. So again, nominative SAR majors are that very small group of SAR majors that work for general officers and only general officers that are in command. You have to understand that before we get into the education and training of a sergeant major, we go through a really arduous selection process. We're not going to talk about that very much in this particular brief, but I want you to understand that it's, it's a very deliberate process. So we make sure we got the very best person going in the job that suits the Army the best. So nominative sergeant major education, we look at several different things in deciding what we want to put them through. The first bullet tells you that that we provide cutting edge, new things, things that he's not been able to get in his military education system. We want to provide valuable insights to him that, that maybe only people in other career fields are able to do, or other education paths, or, or senior service colleges, 
or executive management education. We want to continue the education we provide that SAR major so we can be the very best leader for you, the absolute best SAR major that we can have in a particular position to do the best job to take care of America's Army. Next slide, please. So I'm going to illustrate some of the courses we send them to. Now, you would think that when you become a nominative SAR major, when you're working at the general officer level, that things may stop for you. You've already graduated from the SAR Major Academy. You've been down in El Paso for 10 months. You've been a battalion and a brigade SAR major, and now you're going to be a division type of SAR major. <clears throat> well, the next thing that's going to happen to you, you're going to be selected for one of those very key positions, and we're going to send you to Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, the home of the Army War College, and you're going to attend what we call the Nominative Leader Course. Now, the Nominative, Le Nominative Leader Course is a two-week course that we take these very senior sergeants major to, and we expose them to things that they haven't been exposed to before. Sergeant Major Daly, Sergeant Major of the Army Daly, runs the Nominative Leader Course. I run it. We have a group of people that, that uh, do all the real work at Carlisle Barracks, but Sergeant Major of the Army Daly directs it. He directs everything that's taught in that course. He directs who goes, when they go, and what they're going to do when they get there. And we personally outbrief Sergeant Major Daly on every single student, on every single subject, for the entire two weeks. At the nominal leader course, as soon as they arrive, they're going to take a PT test, just like any of you would have to do. They get measured and weighed to make sure they're in accordance with Army standards. You would expect no less from a senior Sergeant Major. They're not going to go there and, and have a six-hour day and play golf and relax. They're exposed to difficult subjects in a group environment with difficult requirements by, and, present, and presentations are, are by the very best, the, the best we have in the military and outside of the military. And they get into things like, like senior leadership, sensitive matters like, like ethical leadership. They get into the laws and the rules that govern the Army and the country. They talk about things that, that you wouldn't expect them to talk about, but they have to understand strategic level activities so they're able to lead at the operational and tactical level. After they finish that course, they go out to units and they lead for a couple years. And if they are selected for another course, we bring them back to Fort Eustis, Virginia. And we, we have a thing called the Nominative Seminar Program, where we infuse them with all the current things that are going on in the Army at their level. We try to instruct them and teach them how they can be better leaders for the quality of soldiers that we have. So our major Army, the Army Daily directs that course as well. He takes two days out of his time and he sits there with a very small group of Sergeant Majors and exposes them to all the things that are going on in the Army. Then they go back to their units again and if they're really good and they really do well, then we bring them back again. We send them out to Evanston, Illinois to the Kellogg School of Executive Management. We have six programs there that we expose them to. If you're a, if you're a Sergeant Major going into a particular job that we don't have a military fit for that particular kind of position or education that's aligned with that, that particular position, we find something for you out of Kellogg. You may learn how to lead large, high-impact teams. You might attend a course with people from Google and Facebook and other, and other corporations on how to co constructively collaborate with people that aren't like you. Each one of those courses is a resident course. The SAR major is there for all day for five straight days, and it goes from early in the morning to late in the evening because he's not there to have a good time. He's there to learn how to be a better leader. And if, if he, he proves successful there and goes back to a unit and he, and he does very well and he's selected for another position, then we bring you back to D.C. to attend the nominative seminar period two. Will you learn high strategic level ideas and thoughts where you talk about leading large and bigger organizations, where you have key speakers from all over the world come in and present critical knowledge to you that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. And if you do well, you go back out to your unit and you're able to take all this, all this learning and understanding and education that, that the Sergeant Major of the Army and others have worked very, very hard to expose you to. They fought very in a difficult resource environment, they fight for senior sergeants major to get additional education only so they can be better leaders for you. So that lays out really what we do in the nominative programs. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about how we assign folks to all those difficult assignments. Go to the next slide, please. 
Throughout our history as Sergeant's Major, the assignments process has went through many different generations. Um, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily and, and his predecessors have worked very diligently to ensure that we look very deliberately at those senior SAR majors and make sure that we select the right ones for the right job. And we don't want to do it in a vacuum. We want it to be totally transparent. We want to be able to see this, the whole Army. So under the SMA's guidance, we created the SAR Major Management Division. Next slide, please. So take a look at that slide. Let me break it down for you quickly. What we want to do is we want to put the right SAR Major in the right position. So to do that, we've created this SAR Major Management Division out of current assets that were in the Army. We broke it down into three functions. The SAR Major Management Branch, the Command Management Branch, and the, and the nominative SAR Major Program Management Office. Each one of these has a key and singular focus that unites together to eliminate stovepipes under one branch. Go to the next slide, please. The Sergeant Major Management Branch takes a look at all those Sergeant's Majors that are graduating for them from the Academy, and it ensures that they're doing the right thing at the right time when they come out of the Academy. And they use talent management fundamentals to ensure that the right person goes in the right job. And you can ensure, but by the time you see a Sergeant Major coming into your organization that's going to perform duties at the battalion or the brigade level, he's been looked at very closely. We've weighed against a set of knowledge, skills, and attributes that are required for a position against his records to show what he has done before and to align those things together to ensure the right person goes into the right job. The command management branch really gets into the idea of who we're going to put in those key CSM billets. Not only who gets selected for them, but they make sure that the right person is going into the right job. That's key for you. When we send a SAR major out to your organization, we want to make sure that he's the right CSM that he's done all the things that are necessary for him to perform the way he needs to perform in that particular job. And then the nominative Sergeant Major Program Management Office. Now you can see sort of a, pyra a pyramid forming. The Sergeant Majors come out of the Sergeant Major Academy. They move into different positions across the Army. They're selected for different positions. And then eventually they move into the position and are looked at again for selection. Ultimately, they end up in the nominative Sergeant Major Program Management Office. That's where people like me ensure that you're looked at for the right position, that the Sergeant Major of the Army has the right guidance or the right input to select the right person for the right board or, and then for the right position or to compete for the right position. And then ultimately he goes into, into the schools or the educational venues that I mentioned earlier so we can make sure we've got them assigned in the right place. So that's how we manage nominative Sergeant Majors and that's how the process all comes together. And again, if you look at the two reasons why you may want to know about that now is so you can see where you're going someday and you can have confidence in the leaders that are above you. Thank you. Okay. All right. First heart. Thank you. Next slide. Next slide. Soldier for Life uh, program is basically is a chief of staff of the Army program and Sergeant Major of the Army program. It's been uh, established about seven years now and basically what they do is the mission is can you go back one slide to the map? The mission is Soldier for Life conducts strategic outreach and shapes education, employment, and health policies, programs, and services to inspire citizens to serve and to create an environment where the soldiers transition to be productive veterans of character, integrity, and service. If you see the map, it's broken down in four regions. Those four regional teams conduct outreach across the American Army footprint. And basically what they do is they talk to industry to hire transition service members, veterans, and family members to job opportunities after their Army careers. The lieutenant colonels are former battalion commanders, and the mass sergeants are former first sergeants, and that was done on purpose. Those who were leaders and from their last assignments they're at the lowest level talking to those soldiers and could come back with that experience and bringing that back to the uh, installations, talking to uh, Soldier for Life TAP. And when they go back out to the um, installations, they actually do some uh, uh, briefings down to the lowest level so they could bring that experience and what they're learning outside when, throughout their travels back to those installations. They're also broken down into eight different areas. They have strategic engagements, Army retirement services, 
which is actually located in the same office as the Soldier for Life office, which is located in Crystal City. The National Program Strategic Comms, who uh, talks with the veteran service organizations and the military service organizations. And she takes all that information and brings it back to us as the regional teams. So when we're going out throughout our travels, we could bring that back to the installations also. We have the employment team. She basically gets the information and brings it back and sends it down to the installation so those Soldier for Life TAP offices sees what's out there. So when the soldiers are going through their TAP process, they can actually see what kind of job opportunities are out there in their area where they plan on retiring or ETS and two. Uh, the health and wellness, we have an education uh, director. They basically bring all that education, making sure that we're bringing that back to the installations and, and sharing that with the regional. So when we're, they're out there bringing uh, that information to the soldiers and their family members too. And then social media, we have a Facebook page, we have Instagram, and we're also on LinkedIn. And that's very important because we, we take a lot of our information and we're posting it on there for, for the soldiers to see that stuff. Um, the main thing of you know, getting that information out to you because sometimes we understand that everybody's busy and they have their schedules and sometimes you don't get to get out there and get, get to go to the briefings. So we try to uh, post as much as we can through the social media channels for you to see. Next slide. Soldier for Life's approach is to be, being a Soldier for Life revolves around three different function areas. It's employment, education, and health and wellness. We also remain connected with our VSO and partners and collaborate extensively with the Retirement Service Office. And how we do that is to communicate, promote, and develop and shape. With the communication, we want to make sure what it means to be a soldier for life and stay connected to our core at all times. When you retire, you are an ambassador out there talking about your, what you have done in your career. And that's what helps us through recruiting these days. We need more of that, and we got to make sure that we're sharing our Army story when we're out there talking as an ambassador for the program. Becoming a soldier for life is embracing a life of the once, a life of service beyond the uniform. And that's why I was talking about with the ambassador. Basically, we want you to encourage soldiers of all eras to take pride in having served honorably, tell their army story, and to remain connected with the army. Hire, inspire, soldiers take care of their own. We hire and help vets. We inspire the next generation to join the military while ins inspiring Americans to support the Army. And that's what, like I said earlier, the regionals go out and talk with those industries to hire those transition service members of vets. We firmly believe we're the best of the best. And believe it or not, when, every time when one of those industries hire one of us, they're always coming back and asking us, how do I get 50 more of them? Because they are very, very impressed of our training skill sets, what we bring to the table, and they're lacking out there sometimes in their industry or their corporation. The way we promote the value of a soldier and veteran to private organizations, government, nonprofit organizations, and universities, create veteran recruiting initiatives with partner universities and colleges, complement the efforts efforts of organizations and programs that support veterans with challenges such as homelessness, substance abuse, mental health concerns, and et cetera. On the develop and shape policies and programs that maximize the potential of our soldiers as they transition to veterans, serve as the eyes and ears on soldier veteran and family transition, provide that feedback to Soldier for Life TAP, Army Continuing Education, et cetera. Increase data sharing between DOD, DOL, and the VA, and also identifying opportunities to provide certifications, credentials, and other industry recognized validation to our soldiers. Through our, our travels, what we've learned, a lot of these organizations are looking for soldiers who have 
certain credentials or certifications before they get out. If you notice on a lot of Army installations now, we have a career skill programs. We have over a hundred of them that soldiers are taking advantage of before they get out, six months before they get out, and getting uh, certified or credentialed in certain career, uh, career skills. They use those skill sets to uh, transfer, transition out, and when they have those skill sets, they're already certified or credentialed for that organization. So it saves that organization some dollars and training for that soldier to be hired immediately instead of uh, having to wait for that soldier to get certified or credentialed and then hire them. The other thing is the Hiring Our Heroes is connected with the Soldier for Life program. They have a lot of uh, hiring fairs on installations and off installations. And right now they have over like 300 companies that um, attend these programs or these hiring fairs. And basically what they do is they take on the job resumes. They actually do sometimes they do a hire on, on the spot and they take these soldiers and make sure that they're able to get those job opportunities right away. So there's no downtime before uh, they uh, start their new career. That's all I have, Sergeant Major. Okay, great. All right, let's, uh, I've got a bunch of questions. So let's, uh, we'll kind of get straight into it. So this first question really kind of goes out to uh, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull and, um, and also really for Command Sergeant Major Sparks, and I'll let you guys kind of chime in. But the um, question goes, uh, great move taking multiple choice questions out of the Sergeant Major's Academy. Do you see the same happening with other levels of the NCO professional development system? Yeah, Roger, all the, uh, from BLC to the Sergeant Major Academy, the, the courses are gonna mirror one another as far as what initiatives we're taking. Taking the written questions or adding the written question, taking out the multiple choice, making the material more relevant, synchronized across the board is gonna occur across every, every, uh, every level of education. And one of the goals, or two of the, few of the goals that we're working on is the degree plan. I didn't get to cover it at the SASMA. Uh, working a degree plan, uh, bachelor's degree in, in leadership and workforce development at USASMA for next year's class. Um, part, of the, part of the effort to increase the number of college credits uh, that our soldiers receive in our education, we're not building the courses to give them college credit, but if college credit is deserved, uh, and warranted, that's what we'll work towards. But in order to do that, um, we have to take out, well, we have to do certain steps, and one of the certain steps is, is taking out those written or those multiple choice questions. Okay. So all the way across the board. I think uh, Sergeant Major Turnbull pretty much nailed the, the, the reasoning. Most of you, if not all of you, have attended some sort of higher education, college, um, a community college or a university, something. And there are very stringent requirements for regional accreditation that require testing to be done in a certain way. Doesn't stipulate what kind of test it necessarily has to be, but it has to be evaluated, it has to be proctored, it has to be a test that requires thought that represents you actually understand the knowledge. So the SMA, Sergeant Major Davenport, Sergeant Major Turnbull, the Commandant of the Sergeant Major Academy are very deliberately looking at all NCO education to ensure that the test protocols are correct to result in the maximum amount of credit. And as Sergeant Major Turnbull said, it's not an effort to give everyone a degree. It's an effort to give you credit for what you're already doing. It's not to adjust training so it relates to college. It's to provide training and education that can be accredited based upon the needs of the soldier and the requirements of that accreditation body. Okay. So uh, this next question really probably for uh, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull and then also Command Sergeant Major Sparks. And this will be one that uh, you might be able to talk to from a historical perspective. But the question is, is why are we returning drill sergeants to AIT? I'm going to go. Uh, that, uh, they both look this way, so I guess that means <laughs> i got to talk to them. You know, the, the, in, in, I, I can speak from a training and doctrine command background, I guess, because I was in TRADOC for a while, but um, you, you do different things based upon what the needs are at a particular time. There was a time when the Army felt that removing uh, drill sergeants and placing platoon sergeants into AITs would be good for the Army based on, a, on many different variables. Um, some had to do with training, some had to do with 
with climatization. Some, uh, some had to do with just trying to do things in a way that will give you the most positive outcome. So our major Davenport and the CG of TRADOC uh, conducted research over the last couple years and determined that it would be the right thing for the Army to bring drill sergeants back in AIT. Will it always be? Will it always be constant? Probably not. You'll probably see changes in the future based upon the needs of the Army at that particular time, what's going on in the Army with the op tempo, what we're doing for selection and assignments for drill sergeants, and how we think we can build a better soldier. So now, at this point in time, it's the right thing to do to bring drill sergeants back into AITs. Are you covered? Okay, good. So, so on that same subject, and uh, for Command Sergeant Major Turnbull, how do we select non-commissioned officers for drill sergeant duty? And, and in particular, I know one of the, um, you know, the emphasis for the Army here in recent years is they get uh, more women uh, drill sergeants into those positions. We, we're working hard at the uh, talent management. We really start at the Sergeant Major level. A lot of it what uh, Sergeant Major Retired Sparks talked about, selecting our best. We're going to do that, the same thing for our drill sergeants, recruiters, uh, or any specialty job uh, that uh, we want to have a positive influence on. But we need our, we need our senior leaders, our Sergeant Majors, to, to coach, mentor, teach our NCOs to volunteer for those positions. Um, and then to talk with the HRC and get them selected for, um, in this case, drill sergeant. If you want to produce good soldiers, you need good instructors, you need good drill sergeants. Uh, so it starts with those instructors, those drill sergeants going down um, and getting those privates right away. So we, get, we need our senior leaders to, to be involved, Sergeant Major, um, and not just let HRC, which they do a great job, they screen records, uh, but we also need to take, take a proactive approach and uh, get our NCOs to volunteer for those tough duties. Okay. And Sergeant Major, if I can briefly add in a little historical perspective. In 1962, the Under Secretary of the Army at the time, uh, Stephen Ailes, created the Drill Sergeant Program. Uh, he later became the Secretary of the Army. He did it after extensive studies of the Army training bases. And what he found were instructors, uh, today we call them platoon sergeants, uh, instructors, drill instructors, were overworked, underpaid. And so one of the things that he, he, he recommended that he implemented when he became Secretary of the Army uh, was the creation of the Drill Sergeant Program, kind of the father of the modern Army Drill Sergeant. And, and if you think about it, I'm not serving, but I, I've seen and talked with plenty of platoon sergeants who, who served in that role. And if you look at the requirements that uh, uh, Dr. Ailes saw and some of the challenges that are facing uh, platoon sergeants currently in, uh, in the training base, uh, it's not much different. We haven't lightened the load. Uh, so the drill sergeant program was one of prestige, and it was one of uh, remuneration, uh, incentive pay. So if you look to the platoon sergeant program these days, I I'm not sure that they were equally compensated. And some will tell you they were doing some similar duties. Uh, and I was an AIT drill sergeant, so I will uh, add that caveat. Uh, they're doing similar duties uh, for a lot less pay and a lot less prestige. Very good. And, and for those, uh, just for interest, uh, you know, the Drill Sergeant of the Year Award goes, is named after Stephen Ailes. It's the Ailes Award. Um, this, this next question is uh, for uh, First Sergeant Conoco. Um, First Sergeant says, uh, when we come across an employer who wants to advertise job opportunities for multiple locations and career fields, who or where do we point them to in order to have those opportunities advertised to all 76 TAP centers and or online. So, Colonel Ring from the Soldier for Life, when she gets the information from the employment, like looking for that opportunity, what she does, she actually emails it to all 74 installations. All the TAP centers get that information. So then that TAP center contractor actually puts out that information as a new release for an uh, employment opportunity and basically what they do from there is if you're going to go to that location, you'll get that information. Who do you need to contact in reference to, to try to get that as a job opportunity? Okay. Um, this next question probably goes uh, for Command Sergeant Major Turnbull and uh, Command Sergeant Major Spark. So the question uh, begins, how do we link the non-commissioned officer professional development system to better prepare 
command Star Majors, Star Majors to lead at the next level? Do we focus too much on command Star Majors? Um, eight Alpha Star Majors are no longer nominative, but are we preparing them as it is actually a larger group of NCOs? You want to start that one? If you, if you look at the Sergeant Major population in, in, in the macro, and you, you break it down whether you're a six, a seven, an eight, um, and, and you begin looking at, at how we start the, the, the training continuum, so to speak, if you look at the, at the beginning, and it begins before the Sergeant Major Academy, when you start, you really start beginning with the Master Leader course. Now, that course is relatively new, and it's, it's going to go through different, different um, gyrations and changes and things until it's exactly what we want, but it's doing pretty well at this point. So that's designed to, to prepare you for those Master Sergeant and First Sergeant type duties, which are very, can be similar to those um, level six Sergeant Major kind of functions. So the answer to, to how do we prepare the level eight guy or the level nine guy is really all the same. Every year we do a series of analysis or analyses and interviews and tests and critiques to sort of evaluate what we're currently doing now. I'll give you an example of just one way we do that. And, and this is all falls under the Sergeant Major of the Army's office, which he's my boss. He directs me to do different sorts of analysis to make sure we're doing the, the right kind of thing. So this afternoon or tomorrow at some point in time, I'll be interviewing Lieutenant General Daly to discuss what he thinks about the nominative Sergeant Major population and Sergeant Majors in general. And he'll tell me based upon the different levels of command that he's been in, what he thinks about Sergeant Majors and how we're doing and what we should do differently. And we'll compile that data into an interview report and it'll go back to the SMA and then it'll go down to all those schools that touch uh, Sergeant Major training and education. And we'll make adjustments based upon those things. So that will, that will demonstrate, or that demonstrates how we get to those particular set of, of, of things we teach in the nominative Sergeant Major education process. But it also demonstrates how we train battalion and brigade level Sergeant Majors at the Sergeant Major Academy. They will look at that data, that'll be what the general officer, the person that's actually in command says, and we'll extrapolate things from that data and see where they need to be placed. Other things occur like interviews with battalion and brigade commanders. Last year, Sergeant Major of the Army Daily had me go out and interview six current serving brigade commanders that were returning from different, different places at different times to determine what they thought their brigade command or brigade command Sergeant Major did well and, and what we could do better. And all that data again goes back into the process. Then there's other things that the Army does like the Castle Survey that, that uh, Sergeant Major Turnbull talked about earlier where we go across the whole Army and we try to determine things that, that we're doing well and things we're not doing so well. And then we talk to Sergeant Majors that are currently serving in those positions. Last year we had two Brigade Sergeant Majors work with us and talk to us about what they're actually doing and what, what the school actually helped them with, what they learned in the school that actually benefited them. And then today you've got the whole NCO PDS strategy going on, where Sergeant Major Davenport is working with all the key leaders across TRADOC to include the Sergeant Major Academy to make sure we scrub every single task we do and it's aligned with a particular place. So could you ask the question, are we doing too much at USASMA to train a battalion Sergeant Major to, to work on the staff or a battalion Sergeant Major to be a CSM? Maybe at times we do do that. And then we have to make an adjustment and rearrange what we're doing and lengthen some parts and shorten other parts. So it's a, it's a process that's always in flux and always moving. There's never a time when we can sit back and say, we've got the NCO education system down and it's perfect. Because about the time we say that, things will change in the field and we'll need to make more adjustments. So I realize that's kind of a long-worded, windy answer, but the reality is it's just a ship that's sailing all the time and we're making course adjustments to make sure we're doing the right thing. And whoever brought up the question, if you got some ideas after this panel is over with, see me or Sergeant Major Turnbull down, down at the base and We'll talk to you about it, and we'll take your ideas right over to Sergeant Major of the Army Daily to see if we can incorporate them into something that we're doing now. Cool. So no, no reason why you can't bring it straight to us. Great answer. And I think, I think the thing to take from that is that, you know, is, is the surveys out there with commanders in the field and, and their feedback on, on how we're doing with NCO education. So next question. For, uh, and I'll start with uh, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull. And, 
And, and really, if you look out here in the audience, I mean, we've got representation across the Army from all three components, regular Army, Army National Guard, and Army Reserve. So the question is, is are there any differences in course delivery or content, or for that matter, and I'll add credit, uh, for the reserve components? Currently, there is. There is, there is some differences. Um, and we're going to line all three components uh, to create the one Army school system, where a regular Army soldier can go to AC or RC course, a reserve can go to active duty guard. It doesn't matter because the curriculum is all the same. Right now, the reserve guard, usually their, um, their POIs or their curriculum, they run the courses seven days a week. In active forces, we typically ran five days a week, um, which was a burden on the reserve force because it took them out of their, their um, the regular job for, for a lot longer time if they came to an AC, AC course. Or we had to do it in phases, which is, is not the uh, best learning environment to do something over a period of a long time. So under the One Army School System, um, we'll run all courses. It would be six days a week training. Um, again, to shorten the time that our soldiers are away from home station or reserve guard that are away from their, their other jobs. Um, all the schools, the pre-OI, the curriculum, are all going to be 100% matched. Um, so a soldier today might get a notice to go to an AC, RC, or reserve course uh, that's closest to their, their station where they're from versus, um, for example, the soldiers at Fort Lewis who go to North Fort under the Washington State Guard and go to ALC or SLC versus flying all the way to Fort Benning, spending the money uh, to get there, plus TDY, plus being gone longer. They go right over to North Fort um, and be home every night. Um, it saves time, saves money, and saves the soldier uh, being away from their formation for a long period of time. So yes, long story is, all three components will have the same exact curriculum, POI, and delivery method. Their soldiers or their instructors will teach the way uh, ACRC and reserves will all teach the same, all uh, qualify for the instructor's badge, uh, the new curriculum or the faculty development curriculum that we've put in place, they're all subject to follow the same standards. Okay. All right, good. And I, and I think the point there is that, um, you know, the, the courses are all the same. So whether you're a regular Army, you can go to a, a, an Army National Guard school. If you're Army Reserve, you can go to a regular component school. Correct, sir. Okay, so uh, first, Sergeant, down on the end, um, what metrics are tracked to ensure the mission of Soldier for Life is being met? So uh, before I left, I know they were trying to, uh, to get the exact metrics down from the lowest level up. So I know they were talking with MCOM and build, um, building the database down in MCOM to get that, those numbers uh, back to so we have the correct metrics. So uh, I know the South team is here. They have a table set up uh, across from registration, so they can answer that question better than I can right now since I've been out for about 120 days. Okay. For um, Command Sergeant Major Sparks, question is, is that not understanding who goes to the different levels of the nominative Sergeant Major course, does the sequence on the slide line up with the different star levels assigned? That's a great question. For the most part, they do. Uh, as you can imagine, there, there are some jobs, uh, and I, I don't want to illustrate positions. Somebody might be, I, I can't really see who's out in the audience because these lights are, are blinding all of us up here. But the, there, there are some jobs that require different types of education. So while you might work for a two-star general, you may not require a certain seminar or a certain type of external education. We very deliberately, the, the SMA requires us to, um, we, we very deliberately look at each person and look at each position. And it's probably more deliberate than at any other level, actually. Uh, we'll, we'll, we might see a particular SAR major that comes from a particular background that's going into a particular job that's already had a series of education or experiences that would cause him not to, not to require this particular thing that we were going to send him to. So it truly is tailored for the SAR major and the position. Generally speaking, you could look at it and say it is aligned with, with uh, 
the, the number of, of stars in that particular general officer position that he's assigned to, uh, to work for. Um, and one other quick comment, I didn't want to belabor the drill sergeant point, but, uh, but uh, earlier when we were talking about selection, it, it's important to understand, uh, and I know things look different when you're a consumer, when you're the person that's gonna, gonna be the person called upon to do it, you wonder sometimes how you were selected. But it's important to understand that, that the, the Sergeant Major of the Army and his, what he calls the Senior Enlisted Council, it's a group of Sergeants Major in very senior positions, they look at drill sergeant duty very deliberately. And he gets a report, actually, from the TRADOC Command Sergeant Major on, on the authorizations, the strength of the program, the strength of assignment, who's going, who's not going, um, just, just almost every, everything you could think about to feed into the drill sergeant program goes all the way up to the sergeant major of the Army. So it's an important program. Lastly, it's a talent management program. Talent management is just not HRC looking down upon you and saying where you should go. Talent management begins with the soldier and the first line leader, making sure the soldier identifies with what he's really good at. And he talks to the first line leader and the first line leader gives him direction about what he should be really good at. And that feeds its way up all the way to the ACOM SAR major that can say, I wanna make sure this guy gets in drill SAR in school or gets in recruiting school. My son-in-law is a recruiter out in California. His SAR major is responsible for him becoming a recruiter. He talked to him, said, this is what I think you should do. And that's what they put in together. And ultimately that's what he was assigned to do. So the, the talent management process is all of us, not just one entity commanding someone to go to a certain thing. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Okay, great. Um, this next question I'll throw out for, uh, for Command Sergeant Major Turnbull and then uh, the other panel members, you can kind of chime in if you like. Uh, question is, uh, and this comes from the, the, the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force, um, what is the thought about the importance of education and training opportunities with international partners or foreign armies? Do you have any ideas of the challenge to get better relationships with allies in non-commissioned officer levels in the future. Uh, it's, it's super important, sir. I know you're out there somewhere. I know you told me you're gonna have a question for me. Um, it's, it's greatly important. We learned early on in Iraq and Afghanistan, not only was the language a barrier, but more importantly was uh, not understanding the culture could get us in more trouble than, uh, than anything else. Uh, I'm trying to build up a country not knowing their culture, uh, it doesn't mix. So unfortunately, you know, we don't control who internationals come to our, our, our academies. Um, you know, we, we do get them at the Star Major Academy, we get them at CGSC and in the War College, et cetera. Um, but we work really hard for, at USASMA, that's probably the real touch point where, uh, unless, there, unless there's an, you know, the academies over in Europe or Korea, um, but we, we maintain a ratio, so we'll have two international students per small group um, to keep the ratios about the same. Uh, this year, we have one of the largest international groups that we've had at USASMA in, in quite a while, so uh, the, the, it's continuing to grow, um, but again, we'll just ma maintain the ratios. But uh, we get a, you get a different, uh, philosophy when you have international students, different viewpoints. It's uh, critical for our NCOs to understand it's not always uh, the American way. Yeah, Sorry, Mayor. Okay, and then for uh, Sergeant Major Sparks, I'll just kind of throw this one out. Also tied with um, international students, can international students attend any of the nominative Sergeant Major executive level courses? Good, another good question. Uh, to first to caveat what uh, Sergeant Major Turnbull said, you know, the, the international student process is, is pretty deliberate and it starts all the way with, from Department of the Army on, on what's, what countries we want to partner with and which countries would be a, uh, uh, have soldiers that would be a best fit in certain places. So it, it, it's not just um, kind of all over the map, it's, it's very deliberate and it starts in an office up at the Pentagon and it works its way down through separate command channels, down through CAC to the SAR Major Academy um, in a partnership with those countries. And what they bring not only is, is, is a flavor, but they, they bring an environment that, that maybe we're not aware of. For example, I went to the SAR Major Academy and my faculty advisor was Canadian. 
I didn't know anything about the Canadian Army, but I, I gained a great appreciation for it when I left. So it didn't just benefit the student, it also benefited me. Um, it, it allows us to collaborate together, and even today we're still friends. So I, I think it's important in a, in a number of different re ways. Sergeant Major of the Army Daily would probably tell you that, that many of the graduates, several of the graduates of the United States Army Sergeant Major Academy went on to be the Sergeant Major of their Army back in their own country. So it's a great program for us and it's a great program for them. Relative to the nominative education processes, we haven't had it happen yet, um, but I'm certain we would entertain it. We haven't had Department of the Army um, indicate that there was a particular country that they wished for us to host in the nominative program. But I'm certain if they did, or there was a particular um, country that had a nominative program similar to what the United States Army does, we would certainly take a look at it, within, within reason, obviously. We want to make sure that the right person is going to the right course and all the, the stipulations and prerequisites were met, but it's certainly something we could do. Okay, good. So this question really, I guess, pertains and uh, supports for all of our mid-grade to senior non-commissioned officers in the audience. The question is, is, will instructor duty help your career? And, and, and with instructor duty, you might just go ahead and transition that into uh, broadening assignments. I'll, I'll take this one first, I guess. Yeah. Ironically, Sergeant Major Daly and I were just in, in a meeting where the TREDEX Sergeant Major briefed how we're doing um, with instructor assignments and promotions. The, the, and it, it's a really a good news story. We're seeing an upward trend of promotions for instructors. And we're also seeing instructors um, looked at with a higher level of or degree of value. And I will tell you that almost everyone inside of the senior non-commissioned officer leadership uh, arena um, is committed to making sure we get the right person the right job. I, I think it, it, there's always a, a, a side of it that's, that's difficult. You probably are, are keenly aware that mid-grade and, and senior NCOs are some of the most sought after uh, people inside of the Army for different positions. We need staff sergeants to be drill sergeants, we need staff sergeants to be recruiters, we need staff sergeants to be instructors, and we need staff sergeants to be squad leaders. So that's where the, the, that whole talent management world comes into place to make sure that we look at the right staff sergeant or the right sergeant first class after they've done their particular required leadership duty inside of their MOS to become an instructor inside of the TRADOC population. We don't always get it right, but it's a very deliberate process. And I think what you'll see in the future is, is, a, is, is a good um, rate of promotion for those that are selected to be instructors. Now, you might see an instructor, you wonder why, why this guy was not promoted. You might know somebody like that. Um, probably if you were to look back a little further, he may not have, he may have been selected when he didn't complete all his uh, requisite leadership assignments, and now he's got to go back and and complete that, and then he, he, if he does all those things well, will more likely be promoted. So, uh, so the answer to the question is yes, you're going to see, and you are seeing more instructors get promoted. Yes, it is good for your career, and yes, you should seek after instructor duty if you feel as though you're going to be a good instructor, because the people you're going to instruct are going to be our sons and our daughters, um, and your your wingmen and battle buddies that you're going to have to fight with later on. Some reason. Okay, good. And, and I'll just add that, uh, you know, um, one of the things, too, that coming out of instructor duty, going back to the operational force, I mean, you speak from a position of knowledge and experience, so. Absolutely. So uh, this question kind of goes out to uh, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull. So with testing in non-commissioned officer education system, changing from multiple choice or fill in the blank to writing answers out in longhand, how do you assure standardization and grading and the, the evaluation of the student? The, um, so to, to, to have a better outcome, we have to have better income. Um, so what I mean by that is we've put a lot of time and effort into our faculty development course, um, selecting those right instructors to come um, teach our, at our schools, at our academies. And then having the POI that, that matches um, the operational doctrine, or doctrine, if you will. Um, but the bottom line is having the right instructors there. We have a couple different metrics. One, there's automation metrics, uh, computer networks where you can type in a paragraph, 
Uh, we've used that for, uh, for uh, some testing to see where soldiers' um, writing skills are, and it's, it's done by a computer. It tells you, gives you a grade back. Um, but really working with the faculty um, to train the faculty so they know what, uh, what they're looking for, so we have some continuity across the board. Um, as you know, at the Sergeant Major Academy, the, uh, our instructors, our Sergeant Majors, go through a year-long um, program through Penn State to get their master's degree in adult learning. Um, so they already have the, the tools necessary to, to help those Sergeant Majors at that level. But we've we got to work it all the way down to ALC, SLC, and, and BLC, where our instructors have the tools necessary. And that's how we talk about faculty development um, curriculum development and standardization across all spectrums of our, our education. Um, th there'll, be a, there'll be a standardization across that. I hope to answer that. Okay. Good. So this next question, uh, if you look at uh, the Army today and you look at um, you know, that 180,000 soldiers right now currently out there in 140 countries, obviously we're not out there by ourselves. So. This question here is, is how do we train and educate non-commissioned officers for joint assignments? There, there, there's a series of requirements that the, that the joint force requires from us. There, every quarter, there's a group of people that meet together to review a task list of requirements that are, that are delivered at each particular grade. That particular list is managed by the TRADOC Command SAR Major, it is approved by the SAR Major of the Army, and then that list of tasks that are determined to be appropriate for the Army are infused into different levels of, of education. For instance, in the old SSD, there was a great deal of junior level joint education, all the way up to the SAR Major Academy that has joint simulations. When you look at places like nominative education, um, we bring in a joint flavor as required based upon the population of the group. So if you talk specifically to the institution, that is driven by, by almost a task list ideology where we develop requirements, develop them annually, review them quarterly, and infuse them into the courses. You might say in the, um, in the master leader course, you may cover three joint tasks that build upon joint tasks that are required in the SAR Major Academy. So they're spread out in the education system like that. And you're aware in units, you have education relative to requirements. So if you're going to do a particular deployment or operation in a joint arena, then your train up for that operation would have a joint flavor to it. So from a ed purely educational perspective, about every year we relook at those particular tasks and see who's required to have them and what particular school they go into. Uh, this next one uh, goes out here for um, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull. So oftentimes the CSAL process selects SAR Majors who will not attend the pre-command course until after going into a position. Is there a way to integrate this, the pre-command course, into the SAR Majors Academy or at least attend before taking the position? We're working hard at the uh, the backlog. I think I knew who wrote this question. <laughs> so it's to me. I know we're working hard at this. We've doubled the, the doubled the size of our classes, uh, included more facilitators. But the first, the, the PCC, this is really two phases. You got PCC with the the officers and the uh, sergeant majors together in a group, and they hear from the army staff, the chief of staff of the army, sergeant major of the army, uh, and, they, and they go through the first two weeks together. And then we keep the sergeant majors for the third week. And we do the uh, school or the um, sergeant major program. Um, so, in order, if we separate that, we're, we're not getting the um, we're not getting the officers aren't getting the same message as the sergeant majors. Taking the army staff, um, we got AMC that comes down, TRADOC, Forcecom. Uh, it's it's awful hard to to get those those senior leaders. Um, to come right now as it is. Now to separate that and put them in a different uh, Sergeant Major Academy would probably be too hard to do. So working hard to keep the numbers going and get the, get the Sergeant Majors in, into PCC prior to them taking position. It's not always possible though. That's the goal. Right. Very challenging, I'm sure, lining up all the stars and the moons. 
Okay, this next uh, question goes out to uh, Command Sergeant Major Sparks, and um, this comes from a, a Master Sergeant who's looking to be promoted to Sergeant Major. And his question is, is, does a broadening assignment help or hurt at this point in his career? The right, the right map for the right Master Sergeant in the right assignment at the right time is extremely beneficial. As a matter of fact, interestingly, I just had this conversation with one of, one of the general officers. I was doing an interview of a general officer on, on what he thought of uh, enlisted promotions and, and uh, what, what things are beneficial. And he replied, education and broadening assignments. But, but with a caveat, you know, the broadening assignment has got to be something that's, that's going to broaden you that, to, to a particular area relative to what you might actually do. It doesn't make any sense to send you out to do duty with industry if you're never going to work in anything that's around that industry or be in a leadership position where you'll be able to apply those broadening skills. So we have to look very, very deliberately at the person and the opportunity that's available. Much like we do for sergeant's major with nominative education. We look at you, we look at your background, we look at what you've been good at, and we look at what the best educational fit for you is. So. In the, in the management of enlisted soldiers, we need to make sure we review what's good for you and what's available, and we put you in that right broadening experience. And if all those things are aligned, then it's extremely valuable for promotion. If they're not aligned, if you haven't done the things that you need to do inside of your branch, like leadership time and those sorts of things, then the broadening assignment may not be beneficial. I would say we have a, a pretty good process at this point, um, pretty arduous process, actually, to make sure we get the right person and the right job. So I think what you can look forward to in the future is that if you're selected for a broadening assignment, that it'll probably be very beneficial to your career. Anything hmm. Okay. All right, so with that, just to kind of wrap up here, uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of give um, each of our panel members um, uh, a few seconds here just to kind of put out any closing comments or things that you didn't get a chance to address um, during the Q&A. So I'll start. I'll start here on the right here with uh, Command Sergeant Major Turnbull. The, uh, I, I guess the overall goal with our education system um, that we're, we're working towards is to develop critical thinkers uh, to be effective leaders in the, in the future. Um, simply reading a book, um, recite, uh, memorization is not what we're intending to do, um, but more think outside the box uh, which sort of ties into Sergeant Major Tired Sparks broadening, um, seeing something in a different light. Uh, critical thinkers, they'll be effective leaders in the future. Thanks, Sergeant Major. If you have additional desire to learn a little bit more about the history of Army non-commissioned officer education, uh, in the uh, recently released April edition of the AUSA Army magazine, uh, I collaborated with uh, Command Sergeant Major Davenport, the Command Sergeant Major of uh, Army Training Doctrine Command. On page 32 is an article, Evolution Continues for NCO Training. Uh, AUSA members get this, this magazine for free. Uh, if you're not a member and you still want to know more, uh, you can stop by the AUSA table and they can help you out. Uh, just kind of like I tried to do today is I laid the foundation of the progress that the Army's made, where uh, in, in days gone by, NCO education was, was not a factor uh, to a, a twinkling uh, of a growth or the idea of, of training educated NCOs, to where we're at now uh, in, in current state. And Command Sergeant Major Davenport uh, looks to the future based around STEP in uh, NCO 2020 and lays the foundation for uh, where the Army's heading uh, uh, it, today. So, so if you can, take a look at that, and that may help get, uh, for you, maybe a little bit more insider perspective, uh, where we've come, where we're at, and where we're going. Thanks, Sergeant Major. Yeah, just quickly, I, I, I tried to illustrate for you in every answer that um, there's a lot of people that really work really hard, really hard to ensure that we have the right sort of training and education available for soldiers all the way up through the nominative grades. So I think you should, you should consider that, um, that whatever you're doing, whatever school you're going to, if you don't have the experience that you think you want to or you think you need to, 
make sure you sound off about it and you talk to people about it. Because truly, the Sergeant Major of the Army and all the nominative CSMs across the Army, all the Sergeants Major, all the leaders, commanders, and general officers, they want to make sure that you get the very best education possible. We want to spend every dollar on education in the best way possible. And it all starts with you, because you are absolutely the best Army that we've ever had. We've ever had. And you've got to fight to manage your career and fight to get into the right schools and fight to use that training and education you get down in a unit leaning soldiers. So trust us when we say we're doing absolutely the very best we can to provide you world-class training and education. Okay, first time. The best uh, advice I could try to tell you is that when you are going through your transition, if you're able to take advantage of a career skill program or a Hiring Our Heroes Fellowship or Internship program for your last six months of your uh, time on service, I highly encourage you trying to do that. That helped me tremendously with my transition into my next career after, because a lot of us are undecided what we really want to try to do. And that's the number one question. When someone asks you, what do you want to do when after your, your Army career, a lot of us are lost and we are undecided what we want to try to do. So I would highly encourage you, if you can do that, try to do that program. And like I said earlier, the um, Soldier for Life South team is here, and they are, have a table uh, across from the registration booth of the AUSA. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for our panel? <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Thank you all very much. A terrific panel. Just a terrific panel.